Okay. Hello, everybody. So, by binding the transition state, what do we mean? Basically, we mean any kind of interaction between uh, catalyst and uh, transition state. Uh, but we'll also have to think about how the catalyst binds the substrate or what we sometimes call the ground state. We're being loose with transition state and ground state and talking about them as if they were molecules rather than geometries on a potential energy surface, but there you go. Um, binding can include changes in solvation. Uh, it can include coordination with a metal. It can, uh, it can include uh, any kind of association or molecular recognition. Uh, it can even include simple proximity by being next to each other. And we'll talk about each of these. But I want to illustrate just briefly why you have to bind the catalyst. I'm sorry, the catalyst has to bind the transition state better than it binds the starting material. So we're going to imagine a situation where starting material is molecule A, and there's some equilibrium constant that uh, expresses the binding between uh, molecule A and the catalyst. There's some other equilibrium constant that describes conversion of A bound to the catalyst to B bound to the catalyst. And then you've got some other uh, equilibria that describes dissociation of B from uh, the catalyst. And we're going to draw a potential energy diagram like we typically do. This axis is going to be delta G, and on this axis we've got reaction coordinate. And uh, we're going to use in I don't know, maybe red will do the reaction that is uncatalyzed. All right, so modestly exothermic reaction. Here is your starting material A. Here is your starting material B. Here is the transition state that is uncatalyzed. And you have to, the activation energy for that uncatalyzed step will just put here. All right, so uh, there are, uh, sort of two different ways your text refers to as being able to do catalysis. One is to change the mechanism entirely. Uh, and the book talks more about that in the chapter on organometallic chemistry. In this chapter, it mostly talks about lowering the energy of the transition state. So let's imagine, uh, maybe we'll use blue, that uh, the catalyst interacts with A to form a favorable complex between a and the catalyst. And we'll call that energy difference delta G um, for binding the starting material or the substrate. We'll use SM. All right, that's how the catalyst of catalyst to the starting material. Okay? Yeah, Kim? That's the change in energy from A by itself to A bound to the catalyst. All right. Now, uh, what would happen to the activation energy here if I bound the transition state by the same amount just as favorably as I bound the starting material? Exactly the same, right? It's just shifting everything downward. And if that's what you do, there's no catalysis. Yeah, go ahead. It looks like you could still have catalysis if you started with pure A, because you could use the momentum from going down. To like you do yeah, so I, I suppose that's, uh, you sort of wonder, could you use it? And, and it turns out if you bind the cattle, if you bind the starting material too tightly, then at equilibrium, most of your stuff is going to be here and not there. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I think there is a nuance there that, that the text doesn't appreciate, and I'm not quite sure how to respond to it. Um, but if you just shift things downward, 
then uh, you don't have any catalysis. So instead, this uh, stabilization of the transition state needs to be quite a bit bigger. If you stabilize it by that amount, delta G transition state, then as we go from here to here, and then presumably there would be some uh, catalyst binding to B and then dissociating. Um, I'll write that down there just so that we don't get confused. Now the activation energy is here, and we'll call that delta G double dagger catalyst. Um, if we stabilize the transition state more than we stabilize the starting material, then this uh, catalyzed activation energy is much lower than the uncatalyzed activation energy. Um, we could get a little mathy if you want to. Uh, we could say that the activation energy uh, of the catalyzed reaction actually equals the activation energy of the uncatalyzed reaction, and then you got to subtract how, uh, the stabilization of the starting material by the catalyst and then add the stabilization of the transition state by the catalyst, remembering that these stabilization numbers are negative. And if you do all of that, you can come to the conclusion that if the stabilization of the transition state is bigger than the stabilization of the starting material, yep, bigger in magnitude, not in sign, so um, we'll use that, and that means more stable than, because negative numbers are more stable, then the uh, catalyzed activation energy has to be less than the uncatalyzed activation energy, and that's where you get the rate enhancement. Okay, yes? So does this mean counterintuitively that if we destabilize the catalyst to A complex, like um, if you destabilize A, will that make, uh-huh, um, in principle, I'm not sure how that would work kinetically, but your idea is great. If you can somehow increase this, if you can destabilize the starting material and prepay some of the cost of going up here, then yes, the reaction can go faster. I was saying destabilize the starting material catalyst complex. Yeah, I know, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure, because I think kinetically they might still say that you start down mm -hmm. here. Yeah, start at the lowest point, sort of. Um, but yeah, we're going to see how one, some ways of, of uh, stabilizing the transition state are to build some instability into your starting material that gets relieved when you go to the transition state. Um, okay, so principle one, starting uh, transition state has to be stabilized by your catalyst. Principle number two is that, yes? Uh huh. So, um, so think of it. Uh, the reaction coordinate isn't necessarily changing. The 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 uh, the mechanism isn't changing. Imagine we're uh, in an enzyme hydrogen bonding to a carbonyl oxygen to activate it to nucleophilic attack. The reaction coordinate is still proximity of the nucleophile to the electrophilic center. The mechanism is exactly the same, but we've stabilized the transition state. Now you're right, it's a subtle distinction, and, and a, a lot of catalysts will modify the uh, mechanism. In fact, you could claim any change to the potential energy surface modifies the mechanism, but yeah. Okay, related to this is the idea that, um, is that uh, the rate depends on how much time a and B spend close together. <laughs> if, a, if it's a bimolecular reaction, that is. Bimolecular reaction rate depends on how much time A and B spend close together. Uh, that just makes good intuitive sense. Go ahead. So the A and B here are two reactants, not reacting with product. Right. So this would be A and B going to product, and they'd have some rate constant. And, and uh, the reason the rate law takes the form of 
a concentration of A times concentration B is because as you increase concentrations, they spend more time close together. Um, and so in a way, principle two is, is the same thing as saying uh, principle one, the catalyst has to bind the transition state. Imagine a catalyst that binds two different things, brings them together. Uh, they're close together as they approach the transition state. Uh, the way the catalyst holds on to them is by stabilizing that transition state in that geometric arrangement. Uh, if you think about binding constants of a catalyst to a starting material, you have a rate K on and a rate K off. And if you lower that rate K off, that means once the catalyst binds to your starting material, it tends to stay there. And if it's there when the other thing is there, then you can get a reaction. So these are two sort of formulations of the same basic idea. I um, want to talk now about various uh, binding phenomena. Um, the easiest to understand is proximity. And this is basically an entropy argument. Um, because when you have a bimolecular reaction, molecule A and molecule B used to have all kinds of translational degrees of freedom to say nothing about the various rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom. They can go all over the place. Whereas in order for a reaction to happen in the transition state, they've got to be close together. And so they lose a lot of entropy. In fact, it's estimated that they lose anywhere uh, around 30 entropy units. Um, so if you can, and that's, that's if the rate determining step is A's got to find B. All right, this is the transition state of the rate determining step. If you can bring A and B close together prior to the rate determining step, then you have essentially prepaid the entropy cost of getting to the transition state, which would be our activation entropy. Okay? So remember that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and we could say that that's true for activation free energies, enthalpies, and entropies. And uh, what I'm trying to tell you here is that if your catalyst brings two molecules together, uh, you're going to lower the entropic cost here. The entropic cost would be if the, um, likely this number is uh, a negative number. You can decrease the magnitude of that negative number by paying for it before you even get to the transition state. If this number is less negative, that means delta G is less positive, right? If I make delta S greater, then I automatically make del delta G more negative, uh, more favorable. Another way to say that is if I increase the change in entropy upon activation, I'm going to decrease the activation free energy. And so even if your catalyst doesn't bind the transition state through more favorable interactions than it binds the starting material, that entropy effect alone can accelerate the reaction. Because, uh, and I don't think I'm explaining this that well, I'm saying that even if, um, if you think about uh, how the catalyst binds the starting material, uh, and if that's enthalpically favorable, even if it binds the transition state to the same extent, if your catalyst holds on to those two things, it can accelerate the, action, the reaction through an entropic effect. I don't know. Questions you want to ask me on that? I don't think I explained it that well. Perhaps with some follow-up questions, we can tease out the inconsistencies. Okay. Adam, this has a lot to do with your research, right? You want to tell us a little bit? Yes, I guess we're just using... Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, uh, Mari, you're, I guess you know, you're, you're in the Michaelis group, so you know what Adam's doing with uh, the peptide-based catalysts. And um, yeah, the, the principle there is just bringing two things together. And, and uh, even if you do nothing else, that can sometimes accelerate a reaction. A way to see how this can happen is by comparing the rates of intra versus intermolecular reactions where we're considering bringing two things together in the same molecule as pretend cath synthetic catalysis, okay? So here is an amide bond forming reaction. Uh, it's not a particularly good amide bond forming reaction because we're using a tertiary amine. I don't know why, I think probably uh, to prevent the reaction from being so downhill in energy that it would be difficult to measure. Um, so this is the in, intermolecular uh, aminolysis of this ester. Uh, and the rate constant here is a, it's a bimolecular rate constant, and it equals 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4 per molar per second. In contrast, you can bring together uh, those same types of functional groups, but in the same molecule. Now the rate is unimolecular, and it gets you to this five-membered ring uh, lactam. And your leaving group is here. And now your rate is 0.17 per second. It's difficult to compare those two rates because they both have the per second thing in there, but the units are different. The bimolecular rate constant has units of per molar in it. And so the way that we, rather than just saying, well, we could divide, oops, we could do some math and say, okay, let's take this number divided by that number. It actually comes out to 1,200. And, and we, we, it, it wouldn't exactly be correct to say that uh, this reaction here is 1,200 times faster than this reaction up there. Uh, so instead, we turn to a concept called effective molarity that we've talked about before. So interestingly, if you divide 0.17 per second divided uh, by 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4 per molar per second, you get about 1,200 molar. The ratio of those rate constants in uh, the intermolecular rate, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> I get that confused every single time. I have to pause just like I have to pause to figure out my right hand. The intramolecular reaction is faster than the intermolecular reaction. You take their rates and uh, the uh, ratio between them has units of molar. And we call this effective molarity. And what it means is how much uh, of of the uh, amine would I need so that K2 times the amine concentration would equal K1. So it sort of tells you for the intermolecular reaction how much of one of these two reagents would you have to swamp in in order to get even close to the uh, rate that you get for the intramolecular reaction. And, and these numbers are, in many cases, physically impossible. I, I don't even think neat triethylamine is 1,200 molar. So um, this gives you an idea of how much the proximity effect can uh, accelerate reactions. Um, and There are some other principles that have been discovered, not only just physically connecting or bringing two groups together to accelerate reactions, but also um, restricting the degrees of freedom between two reacting materials uh, can accelerate a reaction. So as an example, here are um, some effective molarity numbers which again tell you how much faster the inter intramolecular reaction is versus the bimolecular reaction. For lactone formation, 
here is a benzene ring, here is an alcohol, and then in the same molecule you've got the carboxylic acid. Lactone formation in this case would be going to the cyclic ester. And then they would compare that to, um, so this would have a rate, and they would compare that to the um, corresponding lactone formation in, uh, in, in, ester, in, sorry, acid and alcohol that were not connected together. Uh, and if you do that, the effective molarity K1 over K2 for this lactone is 4 times 10 to the 4th molar. So 40,000 molar effective molarity. Um, you could ask sort of comparison, why is it so much bigger? 40,000 is much bigger than, than 1.2 thousand. Why do you think it's so much bigger here than it is there? The chemistry is a little different, but if you had to point to something, what could you say? Go ahead, Austin. Yeah, that's right. You, you have to, because of the benzene ring and the fact that you've got double bond character, you're already constraining this OH to be close to that CH2. And that's, that's, you've got way more freedom up here in this one. Go ahead, Dakota. So just keeping the OH near the CH2 is enough, even though the carboxyl group should be able to twist away? Yeah, the, the carboxyl group does have freedom to twist away, but it doesn't have as much freedom as it would if it were just, um, you know, unfortunately, your text doesn't show us the data for lactone formation for that molecule, but that would be interesting. And you'd expect that to be slower than for the one with the benzene ring. Now, again, uh, this is sort of boring stuff, right? I mean, we know intramolecular reactions are faster, but this is to give you a sense for how much rate enhancement you can get from a catalyst that brings two things together in a non-covalent way. Um, and if you introduce... Uh, additional constraints prevent additional rotation of bonds, you get additional acceleration of rate. So as an example, let's put the double bond there and uh, constrain its geometry. Now the CO, uh, the carboxyl group is not as free to move around. Now your effective molarity, sorry, is uh, 3.7 times 10 to the 11. So now we're uh, gone up from 40,000 to uh, 400 billion times more reactive than the corresponding intermolecular reaction. Um, you can also introduce uh, another way to enforce proximity is through steric strain. So same sort of molecule, uh, only this time we're going to put two methyl groups. Okay. Now, do you remember what we learned about the uh, gem dimethyl effect in pentanes? Remember that in a regular pentane, we talked about how the uh, gauche plus, gauche minus interaction was not good because the methyl groups would bump into each other. But when you put the two methyl groups here, wasn't that an exam question or something? I don't think it was, but I think we did talk problem set question, right? If you actually look at the Newman projections, this confirmation ends up being more favorable because of that gem dimethyl group. That's called the gem dimethyl effect, or if you prefer to use hyphenated names with your martini that you're swirling, the Thorpe Ingold effect, okay? Uh, and that can accelerate the reaction too because uh, in the starting material, you've got the steric strain and it's relieved by forming a six-membered ring in the product. And that's not quite as good as having the double bond there, but it's still an acceleration of rate. Um, even, uh, again, this is effective molarity relative to the non-attached uh, alcohol and carboxylic acid but we're seeing an acceleration uh, relative to the non-conjugated sort of saturated linker between the two. So um, one of the things you can conclude from some of these analyses is that if you constrain 
a previously freely rotating bond, that's worth about minus 2.8 kcals per mole in prepaid entropy for your activation energy. Um, I don't know that that number is worth, uh, <laughs> worth knowing other than that uh, a change in activation energy of 1.36 kcals per mole at room temperature translates into a tenfold acceleration of rate. All right, um, and then this, so just uh, prepaid entropic cost, uh, and then also uh, it, you can use steric strain in the starting material to, to compress two groups close to each other or to uh, generate a situation where if you do the reaction, you relieve that steric strain, and that can accelerate your reaction even further. Um, one last concept about proximity, and then I guess we got to be done to, done today, is something called orbital steering. And this is about orienting molecules together, not only close together, but in a specific orientation. Uh, later on, we're going to learn something about the um, bergy dunnitz angle and something called near-attack conformations. Uh, imagine a ketone. And imagine where the pi star is and where the nucleophile is going to attack. Statistically, it's known that nucleophiles attack faster when they can approach the ketone within that sort of cone of trajectories. We'll learn about why. It's, a, it's essentially just because that's where most of the pi star is, right? Um, but if you have a situation where you put uh, the nucleophile somehow constrain it to be in that approach vector, then um, the reaction can accelerate. Uh, so as we've talked about these things, the intramolecular reactions, you can think of the synthesis of these molecules as the binding of these two groups together and then the reaction accelerates. But we're going to see how catalysts accomplish this uh, as well. And we'll have to wait on that till next time. So. Thank you again for being patient with my technical problems. We'll see you Monday and again on Tuesday, which is Friday instruction, and then that will be our last day.